Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's farming programme. And uh, the weather, uh, as usual, a comment on the weather before we start. And it has to be said that it's a joy to go out into the fields to feed sheep and to feed cattle that are still out uh, under dry conditions. Even though uh, large ruts have been cut where we travel through the wet weather. And it has to be said as well that the wet weather has taken its toll on the stock. Um, it's a bit disappointing to see sheep that carried such good condition um, maybe at the end of January when we scanned them. Uh, it's been difficult to maintain that level of condition on them up till this present time when we're about to start lambing. Uh, we're about a week away from lambing now um, and it has to be said that uh, they, they have needed more feeding this year I think than usual. But we look forward to that and we look forward to this weather continuing. Um, it would be a tremendous boon to the uh, sheep uh, people on the Isle of Man if this weather continued, maybe for another fortnight, but that I suppose is asking far too much. But we get on with farming and um, arable farming has been going on, ploughing has been going on apace. Um, some fields are being worked down and I would suspect that barley has already been drilled um, uh, in some parts of maybe the north of the island. Um, a dry spell in March is an extremely valuable asset. In fact, it's said that a peck of March dust is worth a king's ransom. Uh, and one can understand that to get the crop in in good time and in good conditions uh, has a tremendous bonus come harvest time. This week I've come to talk to a man who has been on this program before. It's some time since he was on, but he has a super story to tell. Um, a man who was uh, deeply involved in Manx agriculture, has been in fact since he was born at Kronkavadi uh, and uh, m moved amongst the farmers there at Kronkavadi made uh, agriculture his career, though not always directly in farming. Come to talk to Jimmy Faulkner. Uh, Jimmy, well known now in the agricultural circles here at Brickfield, just on the outside of Peel. Jimmy, what was it about the, the Kronkavadi people and the men that you met and the families you met there that made you want to, to be involved in farming? Well, Kronkavadi really, <laughs> the, the whole of Kronkavadi really is, is rural. Uh, everybody farmed or was connected with farming. It's something that I've always been interested in, especially in the machinery side. And I actually learned to drive my first tractor in Krongabody at the age of nine in September 1949. That would, that would, that would be illegal now, Jimmy. <laughs> Lots of things I've done all my life are illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm saying I drove it. I, I was lifted on the tractor, I think, by Arnold Collett. And I was allowed to steer it for a little while. And I think that's sort of... Uh, maybe sowing the seed and ever since then I've been passionately interested in farm machinery and uh, for the last 50 odd years we've been still you know still in it now. Mm. Did you think it's crunk of oddy in those days though you've said it was a rural area and everybody was involved and everybody was involved in farming did you think it was the only way of life there was? Well in the countryside in them days it, it basically was the only way of life I mean virtually everybody worked in an industry connected with farming I and mean, farming was a big uh, industry in the Isle of Man in the 50s and the 60s. I mean, it's deteriorated now, which is very sad, really, to what it is. And we'll never ever see the, the, the likes of that again. But farming in those days, when I left school, when you left school, it was a wonderful way of life. Mm. It was, mm. I mean, nobody had much money, but nobody wanted that mm. much money. But it was a tremendous way to live. I think that's what, that's what attracted, certainly what attracted me, and I suspect attracted you as well. It was a way of life, Jimmy. That's what we were adopting, wasn't it? Oh, definitely a way of life. I mean, we certainly weren't in it for the money because there just wasn't any. Mm. I mean, I, my first week's wages was 27 and sixpence. <laughs> and uh, I'd done about 60 hours for that <laughs> in the winter. But uh, everybody else, the same age, uh, mm. you were the same and various yeah. other people, they didn't have very much more. So, mm. And we didn't really want any more because, yeah. well, we just couldn't get any more. Like. And, and we could manage, couldn't and we? we could manage, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, but in, in those days, every field in Kronkavadi would be farmed and farmed well, wouldn't it? They, they, they were um, careful people, um, respected the land, and, and every farm was, was, a, was a, a business in, in its own right. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, after I left school, when I was going around on the mills, we used to go to Kronkavadi to thrash, obviously, and we'd be, not weeks, but lots of days up there thrashing. But now, like, there's not a grain of uh, corn grown between sort of Bella Crane and Kirk Michael. It's, mm. it's all a thing of the past. Mm. Do you think that was inevitable, Jimmy? Um, what, was it always going to happen, or or has have we been sort of um, have we constructed this sort of decline in in the way we've we've approached agriculture? Well, I mean, the whole agriculture industry has changed out of all recognition. I mean, most people in those days they, they 
were fairly self-sufficient. They grew enough fodder to feed their few cows and their sheep and, and manage that way. Today, there's very few farms that's got less, I suppose, than 100 cows today, where every farm in them days had four or five. And mm. I never, ever thought I would live long enough to see farmers buying their milk and buying their potatoes, mm. but this mm. is what's happened. What, what, where do you think, what do you think was the start of, of the change uh, that, that you noticed yourself? I mean, you, you went around a lot of farms as a contractor. Uh, you, you must have done an awful lot of work on, on different farms. You must have noticed a change taking place uh, during your time. Well, I suppose the biggest change really was the uh, opportunity to go away from farming and earn a reasonable wage. And as people uh, progress, they don't want to do the hours that we, everybody took for granted in them days. Mm. And I think, you know, it's very sad now to see that a lot of farmers' sons don't even follow mm. their fathers where, you know, in them days, every father who had a son, he was expected and mm. even wanted to carry on the farming industry. Mm. You seem to be suggesting almost, Jimmy, that it, it was lack of manpower on farms that, that, that's driven us the, the, in the direction we, we seem to have come. Well, there's definitely a drift away from the land, and that has sort of fueled the, the, the machinery boom even in the land. I mean, if you look back in our lifetime, the biggest steps, I think, as far as the machinery goes, being the round bale and the quad bike. Mm. And you can't imagine how farm now without them, but mm. in those days when you went to bale hay, you... You raked it into rows with a horse rake, and <laughs> then you went <coughs> the tumbling rake and <laughs> put it in the boats and rucked it and pulled it into the baler and bailed it. I mean, the health and safety man today would have a fit if he's seen what we used to do. Like. And and yet, surprisingly, although the, <coughs> there were one or two um, sadly notable accidents, um, by and large, it, it was we were fairly safe because I think we understood our work and had a great respect for machinery. Oh, definitely. Like the, I mean, I can't remember very many accidents. I mean, there were one or two I heard of. And, mm -hmm. But people knew the risks and accepted them, and they were used to doing it on a day-in, day-out basis. There was no guards on anything in them days. And that's, right. that's been a great step forward, like the mm. safety aspect. Yes. But um, you, you talk about, you, you, and you just mentioned bale and hay, um, that, that was a tremendous season in the countryside, wasn't it, um, that now seems just to have merged with everything else? Well, I mean, the hay season really started early July, and you, you were still bailing hay out in September, whereas mm -hmm. now you go in and, and it's all done in a matter of hours now that we used to take days to do. But you, along with John Quirk, when you worked with John Quirk, you, you would introduce the pickup baler to, to hay making, in, particularly in this area, Jimmy? Well, John Quirk actually had a pickup baler before I started with him. He bought a, a welger baler, an engine doing welger baler in 1951, which was some of the early ones in the Isle of Man. And uh, he had that right up to the time, I think, a year or two before I left, and it was changed for a PDO-driven one. But I mean, that baler done a lot of work, but the modern baler today, you could do as much in two hours as we were doing all day. <laughs> and yet we were bailing and. Dobby and Michael and Santon and all over the place. And I honestly don't know how we ever done it. How how did you stand the pressure? Because the pressure on even if you've got your own baler, um, there was there was tremendous pressure uh, weather-wise. For example, if a field of hay was ready and the sun was shining and rain was forecast tomorrow, how did a contractor cope with the pressure that that brought? With great difficulty, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I mean, you just had to do your best and, and to be honest with people then try and let them know when you'll be there, but it was very difficult to keep everybody happy. Yeah. In fact, virtually impossible, I would say. And and I think we, we've touched on this before, but it, when, when you were working with John Quirk, and that's how we remember you starting, really, um, hours didn't mean a thing, did they? Oh, hours meant nothing. Like, I mean, you worked until the job was done, and if you finished at 6 or 7 o'clock, it was a bonus, but if you're still you know, working at 10, 11 o'clock, it didn't seem to matter. And, in the winter time, we'd often be shifting the mill at night after tea, after we'd finished somewhere. And you'd be going maybe sometimes even 10 miles the next farm and set up for first thing in the morning. we have just done it and mm. accepted it as a way of life, really. Mm. And I know a story that, that you've told, and I know, I know we, we've, we've, we've told it before. It's worth repeating, though. When, when you were um, uh, bailing for Claddy Quine, I think it was, uh, at Grieber, Clary, who's just, uh, who died recently and, and his, his uh, effects were <coughs> sold quite recently, Tell us about the night you, you were bailing for Clary, Jimmy. Uh, yes, we, we were bailing <coughs> in the field, which watch, I think it's Watchman's Nurseries there now, behind the, the pub there. And we were still bailing hay, like when they were coming out of the pub. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those nights where there wasn't any dew and we could carry on. And I mean, that was quite common, really. You know, and 
a lot of the other people that of our age done exactly the same thing. Yeah, it, it seemed to be the thing, didn't it, to work late into the night and 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 to, just to continue, just to keep going. Well, you had to do it because you had that much work to do, and and the bailers in them days were relatively slow. It was the only way you could cope with the work. Mm -hmm. What about um, now? Often contractors would get work to do that perhaps a farmer wouldn't want to do himself. A difficult field, perhaps. You, you must have met some of those in your in your time. Yes, we, we've done quite a few, especially mm -hmm. road raiding. Gorse. I've done a lot of steep fields, which sadly most of them now have reverted back to gorse because they asked me in the labour on the farms to keep them clear. But in those days, everybody was keen to get the last acre, and they've done some really steep fields and ploughed them and road raided them. And, you go back today and they're six foot high on course and you yeah. think we'll find it up all over. Yeah. Times have changed and... Where, a, were the, where were the, the memorable places that, that, that you, you sort of um, looked at and said, you know, I've done a good job there and it looks well? Well, I've done um, lots of steep fields. I've done one at um, Glenlock across the railway line and uh, we ploughed roadway that with a Ford's and Major tractor and then we ploughed it and it down in grass for a long time but the course has gradually crept back. Yeah. Another one which I don't, which is out on the switchback road underneath what they call the White Stones, a very steep one, and I rode away to that for Roy Callan and I ploughed it. And we ended up, Roy sew the grass seeds with the fiddle and he harrowed them in with a horse and a single kip of harrows. <laughs> and it, it, it kept the good right. grass for years, but of the grass has come, the uh, gorse has come back now yeah. and it's, it's full of gorse again. Did, did you sort of accept a, a, a steep field and a difficult job as a challenge? Well, I suppose in one way you did, but you, you accepted because you had to do the work to earn the money to pay your bills, and <laughs> it was just a way of life. And other people were doing it as well. I mean, I wasn't the only one. But this is when you started on your own, of course. When I started on my own, yeah, yeah. yeah. Although I'd done some when I was with John Quirk as mm -hmm. well. And in those days, it was all two wheel drive tractors, there was no safety frames, there was no four wheel drive. And it might even have been before the days of live clutch and live PTO. Or? Um, no, basically, well, the tractors them days did have a, a dual clutch, um, but they had no four-wheel drive, no safety frame, and you, know, you, you just went about it the best way you could, and we all seemed to manage. It wasn't a bad way to to learn the the skills, though, Jimmy, um, on those tractors. Well, not really. Like when uh, when I look back, like if we'd had so the modern-day tractors with the power they got and the traction they got, the, the job would have been easy. Mm. And um, but we had nothing else, nobody had anything else, and we just managed because we didn't know any better, really. Some of the steep fields, we used to put spade lugs on the tractor, and that was a great help. Yeah, and and if you've met difficult land, I'm sure you've met difficult clients as well uh, as you've gone round. Uh, were, were, were there any that, that sort of... That you're... No, the, the majority of country folk, to be honest, are, are easy to get on with, and uh, I never really met that many awkward people. There was always people who, who wanted things done for less than what they actually cost. And, <laughs> and that's the one thing in farming that hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, if, if we go back before before you started on your own, you, you spent a, a, an awful lot of time uh, taking the mill round for John Quirk. Um, you must have spent hours and hours doing that, Jimmy. Oh, I've been doing lots. Of, I mean, I've done for six years, and in them days, we were the field marshal tractor obviously and then the, the mill that I used it had iron wheels on it so the maximum speed you could go on the road is about three or four miles an hour and you'd be trundling along at night with just a little six volt dynamo on the tractor and hardly enough <laughs> light to see where you're going and on the bailer they would put a just a single red hurricane lamp and uh, used to come in from like Sadorby and come through Peel you had to come down through Westview in them days because there's no other road and you'd be coming up Douglas Street and the, the up mouth... Doug, up, up Douglas, Douglas Street, Street yeah, with a mill? With a mill, yeah, the mouth <laughs> of the mill would be sort of scraping up in the house windows. And, <laughs> but, uh, in them days there was no road over North View. Uh, and all the farms along this road have, have changed dramatically, haven't they? Well, we came here, we're here, and uh, we'd be 43 years here by Holland And when we came between Peel and Bleg, they'd be getting over a dozen farm workers, families getting a living. And you go up this road now and there's not a farm left. No, you know, it's, it's not not a family not living a, not in a farm. Family, yeah. uh, it's it's very sad to see the way it's going, and this is throughout the whole of the Isle of Man. Mm. So what we're going to see in five years, I don't honestly know. Like, it, it is a remarkable change yeah, because yeah. those farms would have been there and being farmed. I suppose what they, they could have been two hundred years. Oh, no, I mean nothing would have changed for as you say a long, long time. 
But the last 10 or 15 years, it's accelerated, really, mm. isn't it? Mm. I think you know, there are farms, uh, remarkable farms. Uh, farmers like Balakalmurra, yeah. which was probably the best farm in the parish of Germany. Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, well, that's where I actually started my thrashing career, was right. in Balakalmurra, mm. being Christmas and New Year 1954. Yes. I wasn't even left school then. Yes, <laughs> so. yes. And, and the name Kilia Balakalmurra was, yeah. was, was known throughout oh, the agricultural yeah, exactly, uh, yeah. Yeah life of the island mm. uh, and to, to see that that you know even the farmyard and the farmhouse has completely gone, disappeared gone, yeah, yeah bella cross now is gone where you were yeah yeah that's all gone and rock mount is rock gone Mount has gone as a farm the care of bella and yeah it's um, you could go right around the whole yeah, area yeah, exactly you yes yeah so it, it it does it does represent a major change in in uh, in rural life really doesn't it oh um, it's, that, it's that tremendous, community feeling yeah, is gone exactly, with it yeah yeah we, we, we've seen a tremendous change in our mm. I mean, we, we've lived through the golden years of farming, I think. Do you, do you really think I that? I really think that, yeah. I mean, if right. you go back to when we left school, the life in farming hadn't really changed for many, many years. Like, I mean, you, you would still tie in cattle by the neck and, and feed them with, or drink them uh, with buckets of water and all that. But now it's, it's all changed. The machinery's changed, the buildings have changed, and it's had to change because there's just no labour. Mm. Yeah. When, when you say there were the golden years, have you forgotten the wet days and the and the snow and, uh, and the frosty weather? Well, not really. They were all part of life. Um, I mean, I've had some tremendous starvings on tractors. <laughs> I've been up at night and not been able to hardly straighten my legs. But <laughs> it's, no cabs, Jimmy? No, there was no cab. Was in, <laughs> you couldn't think of a cab in them days. <laughs> and with we, uh, air conditioning long before. <laughs> 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 and and uh, when so, so you would you would spend what time would you start in the morning then maybe um, you would you, on a track with no cab, a cold spell depth of winter and stick it till. Well, most time the winter time obviously you were governed a bit by the, the the light morning. Anything. But the spring time I used to do long hours. I mean I've been many a day left here you know sort of half six in the morning to go to rotavate and in them days you had a fifty inch <coughs> rotavate which if you're lucky you'd done a, an acre an hour. And I remember I had a little London one night and get Norman Kane out of bed at sort of half past twelve to give me some diesel to finish. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. But th it was something that you, you just accepted uh, and, accept and, and got yeah, on yeah. with. So having talked about the past, Jimmy, you, you're still in business here at Brickby because uh, well, you 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 moved then from the contracting mm -hmm. to to sort of becoming a, an agricultural agent or merchant. Yeah, we did in the middle seventies. We took on the John Deere dealership and. Uh, and since then we've sold very, well, mostly John Deere, but we've sold other makes as well. Mm. And But even in the machinery job, <clears throat> when we started in this or before that, most of the machinery was built in Britain. Yeah. And today we, look, we sell tractors from Germany, we sell them from Japan, we sell them from Korea now, Czechoslovakia. The implements come from all over the world, and there's virtually no English machinery left. Mm. Massey Ferguson now shut their Bandolane factory, which you could never have dreamt that would happen. That's right. Um, it's a Ford are uh, doing a bit still, but it's all moving. I mean, we're on a global scale. It's so easy now to move stuff around the world, and so easy even to move foodstuffs and things like that around the world. So that's going to have a great change in the yeah. future. Because in the days we've been talking about and reminiscing, um, th there was great rivalry, wasn't there, between the the makes of of machinery, particularly makes of tractors. Oh, there, yeah. there was there was tremendous rivalry. You you either belong to one camp or another. <laughs> And there's some tremendous <laughs> characters in too. When you think back, in mean, like to David Brown, you would never dreamt the David Brown name would disappear. And the David Brown or Henry Kissick was synonymous with David Brown. Well, Henry was a great character. <laughs> he was. And, and lots of people like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, if you went back, uh, they were alive today, they wouldn't be able to believe what's happened. No, no. And and you, you talk about characters. There are people selling uh, Massey Ferguson, like, like Harley Cockle, you know, absolutely synonymous with 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 Massey Ferguson. Oh, exactly. Yeah, must have done yeah. an awful lot of business on yes, the yeah, island. Yeah. Um, and and Norman Christian then with mm. with the EBs selling yeah, Fords. Yeah. They they were tremendous people, mm. and there was a, a tremendous relationship, I think, wasn't there, between the merchant and the farmer? Well, there was definitely. Days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, everybody helped each other. I mean, there was no rushing off to pay the bill at the end of the month because you squared it once a year around with home tide and <laughs> if you put your, your grain in you put your wool in and the merchant might owe you a few bob or you might owe, but nobody's bothered but today it's all high pressure yeah. and that, cash that, flow and that, that really that really couldn't last though could it that, well, it that system like that, 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 that system had to go in today's world it just can't work it can't operate no. but it, some it, customers still think it does <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm sure you're right. <laughs> but wasn't there a remarkable degree of trust, though? Oh, there definitely. I mean, um, definitely. between between yeah. people, all Both sectors cases, of society. Yeah. Everything was done on a handshake. There was no written contracts and nothing else. And it worked. It worked. Yeah. I mean, it still works to a certain extent. We yeah. have no written contracts hardly with anybody, and yeah. uh, all our dealing is done, you know, in the shake of a hand, or even not even that sometimes. Mm. So as you're here now in Brickfield, still still agent for for a lot of machinery. You you must have an eye to the future. You must you must be looking and, and saying which way is this industry going? What must I do to uh, to safeguard my own future in it? Well, it's difficult to know what's going to happen, but I think that the the need for machinery deal is it's going to decrease as the volume increases, but the need for highly skilled technicians is going to increase dramatically. I mean, most tractors now you've got to have a laptop computer to diagnose the faults and. And the thing is, the young people aren't coming into this industry, so I don't know where the the highly qualified mechanics are going to come from mm. in a few years' time. Because mm. when you look around, most of them are, you know, in those, the second half of their lives. There's very few young people coming into this job. I mean, you're talking Harley Corkle. I mean, you go down to Harley Corkle's South Quay in the 60s and 70s, there'd be four or five apprentices there, and there'd be really skilled men teaching. Well, they were all gone. What's what's going to happen then? Because I th I think that's that's going to be one of the one of the major gaps. Um, it's not just in this industry; in many industries, the the disappearance of the apprenticeship status um, it must represent a major change. Oh, it definitely that. does. Like I mean, I think it's the same is true in the building trade and, and virtually every other trade. One of the problems is when you go back to <clears throat> our time, leaving school, the apprentice got virtually buttons. Hmm. Uh, Today, like apprentice gets quite well paid, he gets a day off to go to school, mm. and people say, "Well, when you work it out, he's costing me as much per hour as a full man, and the, and of course they don't want them then." Right. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But the experience they gained from, as you say, older skilled men, and they were highly skilled yeah. men, yeah. Um, that can't be given. It can't be bought, or anything. It can only be gained with only be with, taught, yeah. yeah, with with years. Because I mean, now you see, in those days, most things people f repaired. I mean, you go to the car industry now, you got lovely, clean conditions, you go to the stores, you got a brand new unit, you put it on and you, off he goes. There's no such thing as, as underneath a dirty old tractor and the rain <laughs> dropping on you, taking something off and going off and trying to repair it. And <laughs> the farmer standing over, you know, this is costing me money, <laughs> take over it quicker. <laughs> I mean, look, even like in our trade, the, the charging out rates compared to the motor trade, it's a universal problem there, the whole of Britain now. Mm. And everybody is saying that they just cannot get, or they cannot pay the sort of rates to compete with the car people. Yes. And that's going to be a knock on effect in yeah. the future. Yeah. Just as we talk about apprenticeships, um, uh, Edward Christian North, of whom I'm sure you'll remember, remember well, and yeah. who was our landlord at Father William yeah, yeah, uh, until, yeah. until he died, he used to say to us that there was a joiner in Peel called Harry Collett, had a joiner shop behind the White House Hotel, and parents had to pay him two and six a week mm. to take their sons on as apprentices. Yes, I've heard that too. I remember seeing a letter in one of these um, books about the history of the Isle of Man, a letter from somebody from the Manx Electric Railway to a parent. Uh, um, accepting their son as an apprentice, and they had to pay the MER. Yeah. I can't remember the figure, but it was quite a few pounds per yes, year. Yes, yes. For something like two years for him yeah. to even be, able to be started as an apprentice. Yes, yes. But uh, is is the, is the future from your from where you stand, uh, Jimmy, as 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 a, I suppose what would now be called a service provider? Um, is is the future of the industry here in the Isle of Man secure? Do you think? I would think so. Like you know, I mean, there's there's young people coming into this trade now who are, are quite keen, and um, it, it's something that it will evolve into different way to what it's going now. And I think there'll be less and less tractors sold each year because they're getting bigger and they can do that much more, and contractors are doing more now. But there's always going to be a need for people like ourselves to provide the parts and the back and the everyday bits and pieces that you need to survive. That that's one of the sore points, of course, isn't it? With machinery, is is living on an island uh, and, and getting spare parts. How do you cope with that? Well, it with communications, what they are today, it's it's not a problem at all. Really. I mean, we can sit down. I mean, Alison, my daughter, does all the parts, and she can just tap in the computer at sort of four o'clock 
the afternoon some bit that somebody wants and it's here about 11 o'clock tomorrow from germany that's i mean the world is, is getting so yeah. small now and that, that's nearly really quicker than douglas we can get quicker usually from there than we can from nottingham <laughs> <laughs> So and and this this it's going to be more and more of this. It's going it? to be more and more. The, hmm. <clears throat> the the facility exists now to move products very quickly across great vast expanse. The problem is the same thing applies to maybe milk and things like that, which is becoming a problem to the farmer that he's competing not with the man down the road, with somebody in Poland hmm. Or, hmm. or somewhere hmm. like that. Hmm. So so Jimmy, you, you, you know we we are, we're both getting to the age where we can say when we look back. When you look back, um, are there any things you'd, you wish you'd have done differently than, than, than you have done? Uh, I think on balance I would say no, like I, I've enjoyed doing what I've done most of the time. Um, and I've seen you know, a lot of changes, I've met a, I've met a lot of very nice people in my life and I haven't had that many problems. And um, I would hope that we would go on like this for a long time yet. Yeah. And and you know and there's this room probably for people to succeed you in in your business you know here here in the island so that part of it is well there's, no matter what you do in any business there's always somebody else who'll come along and do it equally as well or better I mean we we, we like to think that we're the best <laughs> at what we do but we aren't like we're just uh, we're just average people really we've got to believe it so a bit to, yeah, to, to, to keep going keeps you going <laughs> <laughs> but as you as you yeah. said here Jimmy there's a lot of work going on around about you here now. Mm. Uh, particularly on a farm that was, you know, it was again was a very very good farm, uh, and we're talking about Bolla Wattleworth, yeah. which which surrounds Brickfield almost. It does, yeah. yeah. Uh, and to see that now converted mm. into concrete and houses, it doesn't doesn't lie easily with with someone who had a genuine love of the land. Well, when we came here, we were sort of miles out in the country. There was no houses, whatever. Like, and they've crept out now, and and they're building alongside us now, and, and the houses are growing quicker than a, a field of barley grows. They're shooting up daily. It's, <laughs> I mean, it, it beats me where all the buyers come from but they still keep coming yeah, yeah. and the cost now is, is frightening mm. it, it, it it's hard to look at I, I don't care to look over the hedge as I go mm. port down road mm. now because I remember the sort of the coffee coloured soil that that was underneath those fields that, well, that was very very fertile exactly I mean, sometimes I go along the switchback and I'll, I'll pull into the one of the laybys <clears throat> and just park the car and look down over the west and I, I can see me mind's eye I can see John Kenyuk down there with his <laughs> crop master tractor Tom Kizik uh, plowing I can see Vulti Kilia going in with the cows and yeah. and you look down there and there's nothing seen the, the no. country's sterile yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, it, it represents a whole new uh, a whole new way of life in the countryside doesn't oh, it, it is yeah it's uh, but it, the, the the nostalgia and the regrets will probably only last just as long as we do Jimmy because the new generation growing up won't remember that and and uh, and they'll just accept it for well, what exactly. it is I mean it can be maybe in 30 40 years from now we'll be sitting here in our semi frames and, and saying well <laughs> if you remember back to the start of the century it was so good and now it's so different I mean things evolve and they change and and you've got to change with them but as you say there'll be a different breed of people come along and they will see it in a different light entirely. The good thing, I suppose, Jimmy, in it all, um, having looked back over a, a career spent in agriculture, both of us can say that we're, we're still here to enjoy it, well, exactly, whatever yeah. it is. Whatever it is, uh, yeah. And we still remain quite positive. Yeah, you yeah. do, and I, I and I believe I do as well. Oh, yeah. uh, and that's that in itself is is quite satisfying, isn't it? Well, it is really. Yes, I mean, you've got to be positive. And yeah. You can talk yourself into the depression. <laughs> I, I think both of us can say we wouldn't have changed a thing um, oh, along the way in which we've come. I would say you're right there, yeah. <laughs> Jimmy, we've come to the end of our time now. It's been good to come back to you and uh, and share because I know that, that uh, you know, this area in the west of the island um, and, and farming and the land is, is something very close to your heart. Uh, and it's good to share your thoughts as we move on into, into new times. Yes, it's it's nice to see how it'll evolve now, and it will change again. And even the rest of our life, no doubt, we we'll yeah. see changes that we wouldn't maybe think today. So all we can do is accept what comes along and hopefully make the best of it. Jimmy Faulkner, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to share with us your thoughts uh, as we come to the end of this again another fine day, and we look forward to to moving on again tomorrow. Thank you.